Today's video has been sponsored by Fanhome and their gorgeous USS Enterprise D model kit that you assemble yourself. This highly accurate 70cm long model is made of die cast metal parts, with spectacular lighting for the engines, nacelles, deflector, and the windows across the hull of this truly iconic spacecraft. It has every detail you'd want, right down to the Aztec patterning, and you can even separate the saucer. Check out the links below to start your monthly subscription, where you'll receive new parts for your model as well as a collector's guide with detailed instructions on how to snap and screw together your very own Enterprise D. The magazine also comes packed full of behind the scenes insights, starting with an in-depth interview with legendary artist Andrew Probert discussing how he designed the Galaxy class. Future issues will go into how every episode of The Next Generation was made, with yet more interviews and behind the scenes art and photos. Alongside the model parts and magazine, the subscription also includes a mug and a t-shirt, as well as a screw box and illustrated binder to help you keep everything organised. Click the link in the description and pinned comment to start your model now. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hojiwana and today we are finally taking a long overdue look at radiators. Thermal regulation is a vital part of any spacecraft and radiators are a key component in such systems, but are often completely overlooked which I think is mostly down to ignorance. I mean, how many times has space been shown to freeze stuff instantly? If that's true then that means spacecraft fly around in something that's super cold, so what do you need thermal regulation for? Well, that's not exactly correct. Empty space has almost no particles in it, making it a fantastic insulator as anyone with a vacuum flask knows. This is because out of the three types of heat transfer, conduction, convection and radiation, only the last one is able to work in space as the other two require physical contact to occur. However, thermal radiation is not a fast process. All the heat that builds up on a spacecraft from electrical systems, the crew's body heat and even incoming sunlight may very well overpower the ability of a ship to dump its waste energy. That is where thermal regulation systems come in, collecting that waste heat and transferring it to specialised radiators that are optimised for emitting thermal energy. The ISS does this with a number of different coolants, with the international segment running off two, water and ammonia. The water warms up as it cycles around and through the crew section before being put into a heat exchanger to transfer the collected energy to the ammonia. That then runs out into the radiators, these big white panels, to be fired off into space as photons. As a note, these panels on the ISS are low temperature radiators designed to remove the waste heat from electronics and people, so they'd never get anywhere near hot enough to glow. Because of this, low temperature radiators can be hiding in plain sight, like those on the inside of the Space Shuttle Orbiter's cargo bay doors, or the ones on the Apollo command module. It takes high temperature systems like fission or fusion reactors to make enough heat to get that sexy glow we all love to see. Everything above absolute zero fires off photons as thermal radiation, but it takes decently high temperatures for an object to start throwing off enough photons in the visible spectrum to start obviously glowing. This begins with a dull red, roughly 800 Kelvin, before transitioning to orange and then yellow as things get hotter. Going higher up the scale eventually leads to glowing white hot at around 6000 Kelvin, which is well beyond the melting point of anything. So those high temperature radiators and the engines on the ISVs in Avatar 2 were really cooking. There's an interesting phenomenon related to the operating temperatures of radiators here too, as the Stefan Boltzmann law means that smaller, hotter radiators actually remove a lot more waste heat than larger, cooler ones do. Though it does require a decent amount of power to push heat into something that is already hot using heat pumps. For example, the USSF Alan Shepard here has a nuclear reactor on board, but nearly half of its power output is dedicated to heat pumping. That lets it have these smaller, less vulnerable, lower mass radiators. It's not practical to up pump all heat energy though, so the medium and low temperature cooling loops may very well be better off with their own radiators. Smaller radiators are more desirable because of how vulnerable these big panels are in the midst of combat, but you can include redundant ones as long as you're okay with the mass penalty and radiators 
sensors radiating into other radiators, reducing their efficiency. The other alternatives are armoring them somehow, using varieties that are harder to damage, or retracting them and relying on a heatsink. That last one puts a time limit on how long you can last before needing to dump heat somehow, either through an open cycle system or deploying the radiators and surrendering. As a note here, I want to mention that Warframe, the last sort of place you'd expect to see this sort of thing, actually has almost the same design as this example on Atomic Rockets. Well done to whoever did that. Now that we've had our introduction to what radiators are, let's look at some types of them, starting with solid radiators. These are the ones we've already shown a lot of, and they're basically just metal panels with coolant pipes running through them. They're low tech and easy to manufacture, but have limitations on the maximum temperature they can operate at before weakening or melting. The coolant is also a problem, as sufficiently hot liquid coolant will start to boil, and molten salt is challenging to pump. To avoid that, you can get rid of the pipes and coolant entirely and instead have a moving radiator panel, a big ribbon or wire that continually cycles through a heat source. These can either be physically supported by a structure and rollers or just by using centrifugal force. If we want a radiator with even less mass, we can instead get rid of most of the structure but keep the coolant, which is now exposed directly to vacuum in droplet form. These are exceptionally good at radiating away heat because they have a lot of surface area compared to their volume, thanks to the square cube law. Because of this, and not needing to contain boiling coolant inside pipes, droplet radiators can be run at higher temperatures, as long as you can safely collect the free falling coolant after it's cooled down. Droplet radiators can come in a few styles, from droplet rain along the ship's forward axis to firing the droplets into a bucket for collection, or even spraying them out in front of a ship like in Mass Effect's Codex. You could also constrain the droplets within a membrane to ensure no coolant loss, but this needs to be transparent in the wavelength it radiates at, and strong enough to not burst from vapour pressure from the boiling coolant. While on that subject, it is possible to make a radiator using gas coolant, just like some nuclear reactors already use. This is done by running the hot gas coolant into a membrane bubble to inflate it. When the gas cools, it condenses down and the radiator deflates, and the now liquid coolant can be reused. There's a whole bunch of technical things to solve here, like how chemically angry hot gas can be, and containing it safely without melting everything. I feel like droplet and membrane radiators like this are perfect for bioships to make use of, though they can certainly work on any type of craft. They're not perfect though, droplet radiators have a lot of limitations around manoeuvring, and membranes are vulnerable to damage, and the look of both may not be what you want for your own creations. Maybe you want something more high tech feeling, and that is where magnetism comes in, starting with this funky flux pinned radiator. The problem with this thing is that while it requires no power to maintain its shape because flux pinning is cool like that, it uses high temperature superconductors and super thermal ribbons, which are like superconductors but for heat. It is a very nice concept though. A more technically reasonable magnetic radiator exploits the Curie point of a metallic coolant. A simple explanation of the Curie point is that it's the temperature at which a ferromagnetic material stops being magnetic. If we use hot iron dust or liquid as our coolant, we can make something like the droplet radiators but more controllable. This is done by ejecting the hot particles that are non-magnetic inside a magnetic field. When they cool down enough to drop below their Curie point and become magnetic again, the magnet pulls them right back to where they started, ready to be collected, reheated and cycled through. This does require power to run an electromagnet strong enough to do this, and it's still possible to have the particles fall out of the field when the ship moves. If you use a Curie radiator for your own design though, then feel free to just have that not be an issue. There is another type of magnetic radiator though, and it is by far the most high tech and awesome of the lot, the Dusty Plasma Radiator. Remember plasma from our plasma weapons video? It's the fourth state of matter that can be controlled with magnetic fields, and it's possible to suspend teeny tiny particles within it, which can end up self-organising into weird structures and shapes. For a radiator using this, the dust is the coolant, held within low temperature plasma, that itself is held within a magnetic field, and it would look super cool. Maybe you don't want any radiators at all though, but still want heat to play a part in your setting. That is where open cycle cooling comes in. Rather than the coolant remaining in the system like in a closed cycle, you just chuck it overboard after filling it with heat. This can also be used in coordination with radiators, with open cycle cooling being used for bursty thermal loads, and closed cycle cooling used for a baseline and continuous thermal load. What I'm really doing here is trying to persuade everyone out there to use radiators more in your designs. Everyone knows that spaceships need engines and life support. Radiators really are just an extension of that, a basic component that needs to be taken into account. 
Even Star Wars does it now and then, with the Death Star's thermal exhaust port and things like the X-Wing's S-Foils, which are both great examples that prove you don't need to stick to realism here. You can use real concepts as a jumping off point, or blend it all together, or make new shapes and use the radiator design as just another opportunity to differentiate a craft from its kin. Spacecraft in sci-fi already often have glowy parts, so why not make them functional? You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon where you can get our Space Fighter design reference book. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by giving us super thanks or by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.